So now we're still talking about ideal ropes or strings, and I want to give a brief summary and then do one more example. So we're saying the first big takeaway for an ideal rope or string is that it is massless. And so the net force on the rope or the string is zero. And that's because F equals MA. If it is accelerating, then the only way uh, this can work is if F net is zero, if it has no mass. So we're saying the mass of the rope or string is zero, F net is zero. That allows our tensions to be equal at each end. Again, this is because it's ideal. And we are assuming that rope, the rope doesn't stretch or sag. This is just hard. You don't want to do this. Um, and so we're now simplifying down and saying that objects attached to each end of the rope or the string are acting as if they are Newton's third law pair. And remember, we use that neat dashed line to do that. So what this means for you, for you, you the happy student, is that you do not need to draw the free body diagram for the string or the rope. Anytime the string or rope is ideal, it basically is just allowing our objects to act as if they are in Newton's third law pairs directly. So don't draw the free body diagram for the string or the rope. Also, you can assume that it is ideal unless you are otherwise told. Again, in many situations, you are making a simplification because it's the only way you can solve a problem. If you're told about an object being thrown in the air, sure, there's some air resistance, but that is so hard to calculate that the only way you can even do the problem usually is by assuming there's zero air resistance. Similarly here, if the rope or the string is not ideal, there is very, very little that you can calculate about it in the intro physics level. So please uh, assume that it's ideal, except for, I think, the one question in the Mastering Physics tutorial where it says, let's work through what happens if it isn't. So please make that assumption. But when you're doing a problem, you should be aware that you're making this assumption, just like if you're making the assumption that your surfaces are frictionless, you should write it down. You should be explicit that you're doing that, because this is an important simplification but it is a simplification. Next, I want to do an, an example. Let's practice these things a little more. Okay, so now we have a slightly different situation than we had. Before, we just thought about one rope that was attached to two blocks, and we said that there was some external force. Now we have two ropes, one and two, and the external force is attached to one. So the question is, which tension is larger, the tension in rope 1 or the tension in rope 2? We also know that the mass of block B is bigger than the mass of block A, just because that makes this more interesting. So what do we need to do? Well, let's make a couple of quick simplifications. So we're going to say that the surface is frictionless probably because the book originally said that, and this is a book example. Um, and again, other things are going to happen if there is friction, but let's start with just a frictionless surface. Next, we're going to say that these are ideal ropes, because that's what we always want to say. Cool. So we have ideal ropes, frictionless surface, and now we're going to draw our free body diagrams. So for block B, I see that it has tension to the right, and I'm going to call this T2. Now, it has mass, so let's go ahead and add the normal force, which I'm going to call N2, and gravity, which, I don't know, was that equal? Did I just do a bad job of that? They're supposed to be equal. I can't tell if they are or not. And we're going to say that the F net for 2, or sorry, B, I started calling it 2, but I'm sorry, that should be B, because that's what block it is, not what rope it is. Let me fix that. Okay. Um, the other thing to note that we should write down is that there's an acceleration constraint, right? 
acceleration constraint. Why? Well, whatever acceleration B has, we know that my rope has that, but more importantly, block A has that as well. These accelerations are equal. So we're just going to call this AX because it's in the X direction, All right? So AX. Okay, so now we're going to think about block A. So I have done my free body got diagram for block B. Now we're going to think about my free body diagram for block A. So one thing I know is that the net force must also be on the right because it is accelerating to the right. But remember good old Newton's second law, F net equals MA. So if the mass of B is bigger and they have the same acceleration, this means that my F net for A, sorry, I guess it should have a little vector symbol, is smaller. It has the same acceleration, but a smaller mass, so it's smaller. I tried to do that smaller. I don't know if it is. Let me just make this one bigger so it's clear. That one's bigger. So now let's do our forces. We know that there's a gravitational force, which we won't actually be worrying about because it's just in the y direction. And again, balancing a normal force. I'm using different subscripts because these are different forces. And now we are going to think about our tension. I know that I have tension 2 backwards. And what I'm ideally going to do, and so far I haven't quite done this, I need this to be the same size as this, right? Yeah, so that was pretty bad. It needs to come out to here because it is a Newton's third law pair. As if. Right, the as if is because these are not just equaling each other because B is directly interacting with A, but because each of these is interacting with the rope and the tension is equal. So you have a Newton's third law pair here. You could have called this TA on B and this TB on A, and then later called that T2. And then lastly, again here, we say that T1, this external force is pulling on rope one, but we know that you have the same tension throughout the rope. And so this means that we're going to have a, a tension to the right. But now think about this. Our net force needs to be to the right. So let me now take again this dashed line and drag that over. Now I need my net force to be to the right. So that means that this needs to add on. And so this needs to be T1. So T1, tension one, is actually bigger than T2. The magnitude of T1 is bigger than the magnitude of T2. Why? Because T2, tension two, is pulling to the left on block A. Tension one is pulling to the right on block A. You need a net force to the right. See, the only way this can work is if the force here to the right is bigger. So even though rope one is pulling the smaller block, it has the bigger tension. Rope two is pulling the bigger block, but nothing is pulling back to the left on the block. So that's why rope one has the bigger tension. This might seem a little counterintuitive, and that's part of why it's important to try to work through it in this very intentional way. And again, note that in this problem, I never needed to do anything mathematical. I was doing some graphic um, manipulation of vectors, but all of the physics was in thinking about the free body diagrams and how, for instance, my net forces relate. So again, please make sure you're careful with these visual representations, since that's frequently where the, the hardest parts of the problem are. And you want to try to get these sorts of things right when you draw the free body diagram, because if I had drawn T1 and T2 equal, later when I'm doing the math, I may have set them equal, even though that isn't true. So this is all very important.